This is the auxiliary microphone, so it doesn't, you can't hear it very well. Pat's, I assure you, Patrick's microphone is much better than mine in some, some unequal, unequal way of doing things. Can you hear that at all? Yes. Not at all? A little bit? That's great. I'm Brandon Ranchus, the senior curator here at MAM, and I, it's my honor and, and pleasure to welcome and introduce Patrick Zentz. It's, uh, it's kind of a daunting task because I feel like Patrick's personal history is tied into the history of the great state of Montana and uh, all the art history that's, that's happened in the past 25 years. He's, he's touched and kind of stuck his fingers in in one way or another, for better or for worse. <clears throat> the usual introduction covers the fact that he did his undergraduate work in biology at Westmont College in Santa Barbara and was thinking about becoming a doctor, but then changed when he came to UM and pursued a MFA, uh, graduating in 1974. And in those, that time at the university, we always think, uh, kind of joke back and forth, that it was such a hotbed of, of ideas and, and art making going back and forth that I'm really envious uh, that, that he came out of that, that wonderful environment. The, the usual introduction fails to account for the scope of, of Patrick's aesthetic and intellectual inquiry. You know, it's just a, a raw listing of biographical facts. But his, his mind is, is really a, a fascinating thing, and uh, we benefit, that, benefit from that through his, through his artwork. And even while he was, he was telling me at lunch today, he was struggling to finish his MFA. He took the four years to do that, and, uh, and at the very last semester, fit in 24 credits, which nobody in their right mind would let him do, except for Ted Waddell, who was his graduate <laughs> advisor. And, and Patrick assured him that, that he was uh, capable of, of doing that and, and continues to, to wow us with uh, feats like that again and again, both from his, from his confidence in himself and his, in his uh, his pursuit. I, I think that the pursuit of art that he uh, goes out after is um, really pure, that, that even though he's changed from time to time, it's, it's been a very focused uh, pursuit. After his MFA, he, he also taught at Bozeman High School before uh, pursuing a, a ranching career um, over near Laurel, and I think that that's an interesting idea that uh, ranching was going to somehow augment your art making. Uh, it's one of those, one of those weird reversals of, of fortune in Montana that we can get away with from time to time. And um, he's, he's since kind of moved away from making physical things, things, I guess, uh, having spent the past nine years writing code and, and teaching himself computer coding. And, he likes to say that he's, he wants to run code that writes code that writes structure. And I found that to be a really fascinating idea. I hope I didn't steal a line from your delivery no, no, here. No, no, go on, unpack. You can just continue. <laughs> <laughs> so my first slide, you'll notice. <laughs> give me that clicker, though, would you? Um, throughout his life, he's been really expansive in his practice, but singular in his dedication to being and making instruments of perception. And his piece for the Missoula Art Park certainly is that. Uh, it's the inaugural exhibition of the By the Bike uh, exhibition, and it's, uh, it, it came about as a, an invitation, and because of his belief in public art and his belief in MAM, he accepted that invitation right away and came back with this wonderful, challenging piece that we have out there. I wanted to take a minute to say thank you to our major exhibition sponsors, uh, Tim Spire and Shady Spruce Hostel, as well as all of the donors who believed in the art park uh, and that it can and should be an anchor for our community like it's becoming. I wanted to say thank you to MCAT because this lecture is being recorded by MCAT as part of a media assistance grant. And I think you're, you're in for a real treat. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll pass you off to Pat Zentz and sit back and enjoy the ride. Okay. Yep. Good. Let me hit the lights really quick. Can you hear me? It'll take a second. It's at moments of such adulation that I always wish my 97-year-old mother was here. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. And thank you as well to the um, donors and sponsors of the art park. I had the luxury of having dinner with them last night, and um, they are uh, what was promised to be the uh, people of vision. So I felt very honored to, to be able to meet some of them. And uh, some of you are here tonight, and I appreciate that as well, as well as family and old friends way back. Thank you for coming. It's just a great honor, and a uh, great honor to have a granddaughter here and a godson. So without further ado, what I'd like to do tonight is I don't want to talk so much about what I do, but I want to try to impart, uh, as best I can, uh, how objects come into being and specifically art objects, and, and I will finish by talking about the piece that I have outside and um, try and explain um, in, a, in a way indirectly through what I show you um, the ideas that have influenced me in my lifetime that have caused me to be able to make the kind of work I do without those precedent ideas that have been developed in the world by a great variety of other people, some of them in the sciences, some of them in the arts, some of them tinkers and makers, and some of them artists. Um, they have really prepared a seedbed that new things can flourish in. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, very grateful that I also um, have had the opportunity to actually meet some of those people, people whose names are common and you'll recognize them when I mention them. Um, a great uh, kind of good fortune through no um, no doing on my part. I just feel very lucky in the kind of education and experience I've been able to have. Uh, I'm no Pollyanna, life's not an easy thing, but it sure is great when you get a lot of good breaks along the way, and I feel that way. Um, I told the donors last night at their dinner that I wanted to start out with th three slides, and I promised them I'd start out with a Charlie Russell slide. I'll tell you why he's important to me at the very end of the lecture. So Charlie Russell and Marcel Duchamp, who's probably uh, more apparently uh, important in terms of my work, and then also Albert Einstein. Not that any way, in any way am I uh, capable of the kind of intellectual feats that he achieved in an amazing period in his life, but he really set the stage for us. These three people did um, amazing kinds of work in the early part of the century. The first three slides I show you are all things that happened in the 1912 to 1913 period. First of all, you have Charlie Russell's painting of when uh, Lewis and Clark met the Flathead Indians. This sits in, uh, behind the speaker's desk in the uh, state legislature here in Montana. Duchamp's bicycle wheel, putting a bicycle wheel, wheel on a seat, calling it assisted ready-made. Ready-made is a term he borrowed from the women's document or uh, women's uh, garment making industry. Women's dresses at the th that time were starting to be made before women tried to try them on. They were ready-made dresses, and he simply borrowed the term and applied it to art. And then Einstein, of course, was working on this general theory of relativity that totally um, upset the apple cart in terms of what space and time were, and, and told us that they were one thing, that they were a continuum. So these three people set the stage for the things that have happened in my life, jumping forward to um, a, a few years ahead. And you'll notice a lot of bicycle wheels in this. I should explain that the reason this lecture is happening is I was talking with Brandon um, about, the, about some research I was doing to do this coding work that I've been involved in and uh, digital uh, modeling and animation and all this. And all of the research that I was doing, bicycle wheels kept showing up. And I finally figured out the reason it kept showing up is a bicycle wheel is such a perfectly designed object. It works for way more than it was designed to uh, be used for. It's serendipitous. It was, um, it was originally invented uh, as by uh, George Cayley to be used in an, he was an aeronautic engineer way back in the 1800s. But, uh, so he didn't apply for a patent, somebody else did, and, and uh, so he never made any money off it, but he, was, he had the original concept of it. This is a Blariot, a Blariot um, 11. The last part of that name should indicate how hard it was to learn to fly in this thin air medium that uh, we were trying to gain access to. This is the first plane to cross the English Channel, and uh, it, the uh, Blariot 12 followed it because this crash landed when it got to England but it nonetheless was the first, first uh, plane to actually do that. And the bicycle wheel is a critical part of it. They had to invent everything 
to put together and then to learn how to manage that in the air. So these kind of technological feats that were accomplished 50 years, well, not quite 50 years, 40 years before I was born are critical now to what I'm able to think about. So I'm showing them basically in homage to what they do. This is a right bicycle with a bicycle wheel mounted on it. If you look up here, you'll see little ailerons. And what they did was ride down the street and put a different uh, style aileron on each side of the wheel. And in terms of the bias that the wheel shifted, they could figure out which aileron had more lift. They would take that one off and try another one. And we were able to figure out uh, which, which would probably be the best design for the stuff that they were doing at Kitty Hawk. This is inside their shop, and I show it only because they're the first people, whoops, excuse me, they're the first people to um, invent a wind tunnel. So it went from that bicycle to the wind tunnel, which is also important to, to me and all of us as well, but it's, it's uh, that kind of experimentation. The slide I showed mistakenly is of Charlie Taylor, and I'm gonna talk a lot about people like Charlie Taylor tonight. I was talking with a board member, Brian Sippy, last night, and he said he has this need to tinker, and I think we all have this need to figure out how things work by fiddling with them. And there are these people like Charlie Taylor behind the scenes of these great inventions. They're the guys that, that uh, and women that make uh, what these big events like flying are to us happen. He actually, the motors were a new thing then too, and he actually designed and built, along with Orville's help, the first engine to put into the first plane so that it could fly. Another person behind the scenes that you don't hear much talk of is Catherine Wright. She's a lady right here. The two Wright brothers were unmarried, and uh, so we all know what, that, what happens with that kind of stuff. They need help, and she's the one that provided it. We, the Wrights would have never flown without her assistance. Um, his, I can't think of his first name. McCullough has just written a recent biography on the, on the rights and, and gives her, uh, her the credit due in that uh, book and if, it's a great read. So then some more of that research that I've done, the early days of computation, the history of them are interesting to me because to understand what computation is now, what that actually means, I felt I had to look at the history of it and how it was developed. This is an early memory de uh, device designed by a fellow named George Bigelow. He was working with um, John von Neumann, who was working at uh, the Advanced Institute study at Princeton to develop the first computer to do the calculations for the bomb that they were creating in Los Alamos. And so George came up with the bicycle wheel and he drove this at incredibly high speeds, magnetized parts of it for the first memory. This is George on the left. Uh, uh, John von Neumann and uh, Oppenheimer in the, on the, to, his, to his right there. But another, another maker here, another guy who could fiddle around with things and get something that didn't exist before in division. It's a, it is as much a feat of technology as, 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 as it is a, a vision and art. I, I see very little difference other than the fact that one has utility in a, in a um, work kind of sense and the other doesn't. So, after this period, I get born, and in 1947, uh, at Bell Labs, three guys by the name of uh, Shockley, Bardane, and Bratain invent the first transistor. And that changes the whole game, because computers up to that point required uh, uh, vacuum tubes, and they generate a lot of heat. So, it, it created a, a great deal of problem in terms of how we were able to compute and what we were able to do. So this invention changed the world before I was able to even cry. It was invented in early 1947. Another thing that happened that is critical to us on a daily basis now is, is um, the, uh, the invention that this guy came up with. And it's, he, and again, you'll notice the bicycle wheel. It's the inverse, actually, of Duchamp's um, invention. He put the seat on the wheel instead of putting the wheel on the seat, but nonetheless, um, he's well known for riding up and down the halls at Bell Labs, juggling and uh, thinking of ideas. And he came, uh, his name slips me. This is a problem of being my age, and I'll have to read it here. Um, and there's a, a book out on him. Claude Shannon is his name, and he's the first guy that came up with information theory. 
And so what he, what, what he did was invent a way to mathematically define what information is. And I'll show you the formula for that in a minute, but without what he did uh, in 1948, about uh, 30 years later, we would not have been able to do this, and that is launch Voyager into space. And as you probably remember, a few years ago, Obama was president, he announced that this spaceship had finally left our solar system. It was outside the solar bubble. And this thing has sent incredible amounts of information back to us. What Shannon's information theory did was allows us to discriminate true information from noise. And this thing's so far away, we actually communicate with this almost on a daily basis still. And the most recent thing I saw was as of last week, we were still live with Voyager 1. It's still going. It's also the one, and this probably is more of a cultural meme that, that, um, that we remember. And that's the golden record that carries information to any alien civilization that might encounter this object in space, um, information about us. It has um, tape recording from the President of the General uh, the United Nations, uh, greetings from our President, greetings, uh, scientific symbols and notation, and uh, also recordings of sound, uh, recordings of things as diverse as whales and other natural sounds, classical music, uh, rock and roll, and Chuck Berry is on it. You might remember if you're almost as old as I am, uh, Saturday Night Live did a special, I think they called it uh, The Week in Advance in Review, something like that. And uh, Chevy, Ch or, uh, uh, one, of that, one of the comedians, yeah, Steve Martin Car uh, uh, was one of the reporters that say, said that we had finally encountered um, an alien uh, species in space and they had sent back a cryptic message to us and that time was going to feature it on its cover. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this kind of stuff impacts the general culture. This, this photograph was made famous by Carl Sagan as well. This, looking from Voyager, is planet Earth, a pale blue dot that uh, you've probably heard many times. But anyway, so what Shannon's and I digress here a bit with this, but I think it's fascinating stuff. Shannon's um, formula, this thing right here, discriminates the noise from the true information. And it does so daily on your cell phone. Your cell phone would be a plastic brick without that formula. So when I was 10, this was a big deal. We were at, 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 at busy with at a Cold War, in the Cold War, in the Cold War with Russia. I lived in Laurel at the time, I was just a 10-year-old uh, boy, but, or, uh, yeah, 10 years old, and um, this beep beep started happening from space, and it was Sputnik, and it was a big shock to America, uh, because we had been trying to prove our superiority by being the first in space. This is during a geophysical year, and there was a kind of a quiet race. We didn't know the Russians were really up to this, but they succeeded in doing this first, and uh, this is at a time, if, if you're as old as I can, am, you can remember, I remember Union 76 gas stations were uh, in, in the state at that time, and I remember seeing bomb shelters, uh, kind of like Quonset huts uh, for sale that you could dig a hole and put them in, the, in your backyard in case um, they bombed us with nuclear weapons. It was an interesting time in America, but this part of this, this story of Sputnik that's not very well known is this. The big issue with our scientists at the time was trying to keep track of where this thing was in space because the beep, beep, beep that was driving us all nuts for political reasons was a uh, locator of this thing in space. And what happened was a couple of our scientists figured out a way to bounce microwave beams off this object in space and tell its position. Their boss brought them into his office one day and he says, what if we reverse that? What if we bounce microwave beams from this thing back to Earth? We could tell where we were. That's the underlying story in the beginning of GPS, mm -hmm. which with, you know, again, your phone's a pretty critical issue. When we decide where we're going to go after this, it'll, I'm sure somebody will tell us where to go. <laughs> also at this time in 1958, um, the structure of DNA, Francis Crick on the left and uh, James Watson on the right discovered what the structure was, and that's, this is the thing I think that interests my sculptor's mind in my biological interests. 
so much of this is about structure. It's how things fit together, how they're formed. And I'll talk a little bit about the Nobel Peace Prize at the very Nobel Peace Prizes that were just awarded a couple of weeks ago at the very end of this, because it's all about structure. This is a physical world and universe that we live in, and structure is key to understanding how it works. And I think there's an affinity between that structure and the structure that um, sculptors study in our school. And it, I think we're at a point where this is starting to come together uh, in ways that we're really kind of unanticipated. They're coming together because of our technological uh, investigations. Anyway, they studied this. Again, there's a maker behind the scenes on this, and her name's Rosalind Franklin. And she's an x-ray crystallographer. She died from radiation uh, poisoning before the Nobels were awarded, so she's never, she wasn't mentioned. She is more recently, I see her name becoming more prevalent in the news. But what she did was create this photograph, or this uh, x-ray uh, crystallograph. And this is, this is a picture of the form of uh, DNA. And when Francis Crick saw it, he immediately, it's a signature of a helix, double helix actually. He saw that and immediately, they were all on the cusp of this um, discovery. And he saw that and immediately went back uh, to Watson and said, it is, it is a double helix, it has phosphate chains on the outside and these pair of ATGC bonds in the inside that are gonna make this a model, this rep that is a model of replication and rep reproduction. And gave finally a basis to Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection. This was the mechanism that allowed that theory to function and persist, obviously, into the present. So another maker, kind of behind the scenes, but fiddling and fooling with new technologies to give us information. Again, imaging is a big, big factor in determining this structure. So we depend, we're such a visually cued um, species that these kinds of things are important. The final thing before I left home that is important relative to the work I'm doing now that makes this object out here happen outside the, the piece in the art part is this is Gordon Moore, who's one of the co-founders of IBM. And he's the guy, if you, you've probably heard the, of Moore's Law. Uh, and that law is simply that every couple of years, we'll be able to double the amount of resistors and transistors on a silicon chip. That's an exponential gain. If, when he said that was in uh, 1965. This is about 50 years later. So he said every two years. So that's 25 doublings. So if you take two to the 25th, if he just started out with one transistor or two transistors, right now we're well over three and a half billion on the same space. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than that actually because I don't know where they started out. But it's a geometric progression. So what he said is profound. And again, without that ability to reduce that, the phone in your pocket, pocket wouldn't exist. The, the computer would be the size of this room, which is what they were when he made the prediction. So anyway, these guys, these women and men together formed a basis for us at this time in history to do what we're doing. So college, I went to college in Southern California, which is where I met Susie, and we got married there. I have to mention as an aside that being in Southern California in the 60s was probably the best place on the planet to be in your early 20s in the 60s. It had everything from the beat movement into the hippie movement, into being able to hitchhike up and down California with it by sticking your thumb out and, and catching a ride. There was everything from MacArthur Park and that whole social action going on. Um, it, was, it was just an energizing place to be. I was a pretty good boy, I was an athlete, so I didn't get into all of the uh, interesting chemicals that were floating around. But at the same time, it was such an energized space that uh, in a way it's never left me. It's a lot of what people could do happened then in the most positive kind of way, and I felt lucky to be there. But while I was there, I met a really interesting artist who asked me the hardest question I've ever been asked. I was studying to, be a, uh, to go into medicine, and he said, why don't you become an artist? And the answer was, Susie and I moved up to Montana, and um, I decided to enroll in school here and see. And I, I fell into, as Brendan mentioned earlier, a hotbed that was absolutely pulsating with energy. Um, three people primarily uh, um, 
did me a great favor of taking interest in me and in a way way beyond what I was accustomed to other than a couple of teachers in college but they they really took an interest in, in me as a human being and they were Rudy Audio and Ted Waddell and Arnold Cherulo who was here at the time and the, the department was with it one of the first things I remember was Robert Smithson was invited here shortly after he uh, created Spiral Jetty and and, and Nancy Holt was invited. And I want to show you what we did when Nancy Holt was here, and this was a critical thing. And it gets back to that thing where you, your ability to express with your hands is a critical component of your ability to express your own humanity. And I learned that through working with people like Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, and um, their impact uh, is immense, especially in the context of the art department here at the time. So, um, Brandon, if you'll pull this slide off the screen and hit that first video. So, um, yep. So what we, I'll let you watch the video, and then I'll tell you more about it, and I'll play it one more time. Can you find it? <coughs> this is an animation, okay, that I've, There we go. This is a piece we built with her. I'll explain it after you've seen it. <coughs> My father always told me the best way to get to know someone is to build a mile of fence with them. And that's true, it is great. But it, uh, also to build an uh, installation is, you know, works just as well. <coughs> so uh, as this is happening, uh, we built these T-shaped pipes. She wanted to build something called locators. And so we built T-shaped pipes that you saw in the beginning there, in that aerial view, that were meant to be looked through from both directions. And it's, it's a way of perceiving the world. I have, I'll look at, as soon as we look at this, the end of this, so these are the pipes and fabrication. We did this out at Ted Bodell's place in our league. This is on site. And then this next shot is of Nancy looking through a camera, looking through one of the locators, the tube, which is one of the pictures you saw. This is Robert Smithson here doing what he's doing with her now in another film. And Ted Bodell's over on the right. So it's a, uh, if you'll just pause that, and then we'll go to that swamp film, Brandon, in just a second. So, so she's building a way that frames what you're seeing in the environment. And you have the option. They make, and they, the film was very important to them. They filmed Spiral Jetty. And I've come, I was talking with Brandon at lunch, and I've come in later years here, and I mean really recently, to realize that what Smithson uh, and Nancy Holt were doing was these are instruments that they create. They're instruments of perception. If you watch the whole film of uh, Smithson's Spiral Jetty, go to about midway and just let it run and I'll talk through it. Um, right there, yeah, perfect. Uh, he's standing behind her in a reed marsh in uh, New Jersey and he's telling her to go straight, turn left, turn right. Simple instruction like that. There's a familial kind of uh, husband-wife banter going on. She said, uh, you know, I can't see where I'm going, she's looking through a lens, and he's going, that's okay, just keep going, it's safe, and it's that kind of silly things we, we expect of one another if we know each other well. That's going on during this, but it's that perception that's framed by a camera lens. He does it with Spiral Jetty, and I think his instrument, he picked the site for a variety of reasons, but that piece submerges in the lake at times, it crystallizes, the salt crystals form on it at times, the water changes color because of the bacteria in it at times. And I think he created something that kind of looks inward, an instrument of inspection of that environment. And from what discussion I had with him at the time and also from reading his work a lot in later years, I think that's what he was about, although he didn't use that term. And here is another example of that kind of um, looking at the world through the frame, the lens being the frame in this case. After uh, Nancy had finished her locator speech, we had a party to celebrate the completion of that. And, um, 
uh, he, Robert came up to me and handed me a beer. He always had a scotch. He drank white horse scotch and smoked a lot of cigarettes and handed me a beer anyway. And he said, about, uh, he, we, uh, three of us had been invited to show the work we were doing. And I'd been stretching rope grids made out of white clothesline um, over the ground. They were about 40 by 40 feet. Studying the contour of the land out by Potomac where we lived at the old Barnum farm next to Hall's Bar, if you're familiar with that area. And he said, that work you're doing, uh, he said, do this to get uh, further along with it. He says, study what you're using to study the landscape with and understand it. And by that, he meant understand the grid more carefully. And so, subsequent to all of that, uh, I did that. OK, we can, we can we'll switch back to the. You can actually kill that um, before you shut it off, if you will, Brandon. Stop the actual video, and then it won't. Thank you. Perfect. So after he gave me that information, and Smithson was a, a kind of a laconic, um, he was very easily humored, but he wasn't, uh, he wouldn't laugh and write all the way. He was just kind of a quiet uh, demeanor, but incredibly uh, uh, perceptive. And if you read his work, or if you've read his work, you understand what I'm saying. Is it, took, it takes a while to comprehend what he's really talking about. But what he's really talking about is, it's, it, it's as rigorous as any scientific reading that I've ever done, or any of this computer stuff I'm doing now. It's, it's, it requires that kind of determination. You have to need to know what he's saying to get through it. And, and I respected that. So I did exactly what he told me to do. I decided that after I graduated, I would study grids. And so the first person to fall to, of course, is Descartes. He's the guy that came up with a coordinate system. The myth, the story, I don't know if it's true, and people debate whether it is or not, is that Descartes was laying ill in bed. And uh, obviously, he's a mathematician and philosopher. He's the guy that, that says, said, I think, therefore I am. Okay? And he also came up with this system, which is the world would have a hard time functioning without as well. But he was laying in bed, and he saw a fly on the ceiling moving around, and it crossed his mind, as it probably only can a mathematician's mind, I could pinpoint the exact location of that fly if I had a coordinate system. And so he invented that to pinpoint coordinate system. We can't do anything in science without measurement. In fact, you can't do science without measurement. That's what it is, is a realization of measurement. You can measure something, you can do science with it. So, I studied just regular coordinate systems. There are all kinds of them. This is Richard Feynman. He's another person I studied carefully. I had I encountered him as an undergraduate. Here he's explaining that the rotation of planets, and I, I include the slide simply because that sort of looks like a spoke bicycle wheel in the upper right there. What it is is it's a rotation of a planet around the sun. And he's explaining, using simple trigonometry, that equal uh, areas are swept out in equal periods of time as if planets orbit the sun. It has a lot to do with this piece out here and three aluminum discs in the pavement that mark the solstice and equinoxes. The thing that, uh, one of the things that Feynman said also, and this is another plug for that maker, uh, scratching that maker, it, it's just, he says, I cannot understand what I cannot make. And by that, I think, you know, he's talking about any kind of making, whether it's figuring out uh, what Pythagorean theorems really means, the theorem really means, or it's how your car engine works, or it's uh, how to run a slide projector. It's, if you can't make that thing, it's impossible to understand it. So he's talking about a visceral kind of engagement with intellectual issues. And I think it's true no matter what it is, whether it's art or science or any other field of human inquiry, I think it's that making. That's why you see painters do series. They're continuing to make, to try and get a hold of that. And it's, or, or it's why you see infinite edits and drafts of writing. It's that continual making so you understand what it is you want to say or are trying to say. And it's that that premise that's critical to us. And it, again, it takes rigor, but it also, it can manif manifest itself through tinkering. 
Another person that I studied, and it's the first person where I ever heard the word permutation, is Saul the Whip. He's the guy that uh, used to make sculptures that they were one form, but he would arrange whole rooms full of that one form in different orientations. Later, his work even took a, a huge step, and he, he really started writing code in natural language. It wasn't called code, but he'd write instructions for how to make drawings, and then he would give those instructions to people, and they would make the drawing. And here you see some students at a university doing a drawing. They're interpreting what he's saying, and there's latitude for variation, and then they, they produce a drawing. Here's an elegant, elegant example of one of those things. But it's, he's like a coder. It's, this is way before coding was the common thing it is now. And he, he actually kind of anticipated it, I think. Brilliant guy. And, and, and so forcing, forcing myself to kind of do what Smithson had suggested and learn this kind of stuff to come to grips with understanding that instrument that I was using to understand landscape was, has helped me to understand what I really am concerned with, and that's our environment. I'm, I'm trying to, in the work that I do, understand what it is that we can't measure that gives us a sense of this place we inhabit. And it's a critical kind of knowledge, I feel, because where we think we are is an absolute, absolutely critical element of who we think we are. And who we think we are is the future of what this planet will endure. And so I think it's a critical issue at a critical time, and I think we have the technology to really to begin addressing it in ways that we never have before. Another person, so if you're really interested in something, and it happens to be, uh, or happens to be involved in it, my best suggestion to you, especially if you're a young person, is get yourself a job as a program coordinator at a, at a uh, museum. And then invite the people there that you want to hear. That's how I met this guy. This is Robert Irwin. And I, he was doing some interesting stuff with Scrim. And it kind of resonated with me at the time because Scrim is nothing but a very fine mesh, grid, woven fabric. And he was playing with understanding human perception with this grid manipulating spaces in very powerful ways. And he still does this. He's the one that did the Getty Gardens, if you ever go to the Getty in um, LA. But I have to tell you a story about him, too, and it, as a very generous, peripatetic kind of educator, in addition to being the artist he is. I called him up. I was program coordinator for the Yellowstone Art Center. I was in my early 30s. And uh, I introduced myself, and I said, I'm really interested in your work. I'd love to have you come to Billings and uh, give a couple lectures. And he said, yeah, I'd love to do that. And Bob blew my socks off. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I said, well, what, what do you charge? And he said, well, let me guess a couple of things. I, he said, I'm betting you don't have much money. And I said, yeah, you got that. That's right. I'll raise what I have to. And he says, you won't have to do much. How about 250 in expenses? And so he came up uh, to Billings in the early 80s and spent um, about three days there. He came out to our ranch. And I was able to spend uh, some of the most productive time at that period of my life with somebody who was profound, as far as I was concerned, in his understanding of installation art, installing things in the real environment and, and working with it. And what he did was he came, it was at it was, uh, or, I mean, uh, Eastern Montana College at the time. He came and he sat down, he had a ball pad on, he asked for a cup of coffee before the lecture. He sat there and Finished a cup of coffee, crossed his leg like this, and using just that paper cup as a model, gave the entire history of art. As a container with meaning, as an object with nothing, and on and on, and held an audience abs absolutely captive for about a half hour. And got up and asked, answered questions for about two. But it was, <laughs> it's, it's the kind of depth that he had that was, that reminded me of very much of uh, Holton Smithson, that kind of, that's that serious attempt to really understand his own humanity in the context of the culture and how he could participate with that culture in somehow adding to 
the information it had as a base. And then this guy, uh, Buckminster Fuller, who you all know from the Geodesic Dome, that he's credited with inventing. This guy's really, really um, significant in terms of bicycles because everything that Smith's in touch, here he is at Black Mountain College and he taught there for a while. He met a guy named Kenneth Nelson. If you know Kenneth Nelson's work, he built 10 segregate structures. Um, I brought one, a 10 segregate structure with me. He came up with a, the notion of 10 segregate. It's a portmanteau of tensional integrity. So, this is, I, so I built, this is that period where I was building the model, so can you see that? So none of the solid elements touch here. Everything is just held together by wires. The wires are the tensional element, and the uh, wood dowels are the compression. This will move a little bit because it's not perfect, this is about 45 years old, but that's how that functions, and you're welcome to look at this afterwards, but he, investigated this deeply. And what his, the best definition of tensegrity that he came up with, that I think is just such a perfect definition of a bicycle wheel, is that he said tensegrity is compressional islands in a sea of tension. And it's exactly what a bicycle is. That hub is nothing but an island in a sea of tension. And the rim as well as a, a compressive element. So. I was able to hear him lecture once at, uh, in Bozeman while I was teaching at the high school there. And the lectures are impossible to decipher because he talks very rapidly. I always said, obviously, he's geometrically brilliant. He understands things geometrically. And so he, he would just utter everything he knew on top of a stool, look like a wizard on a stool, and, and give his talk. And everybody was just kind of stunned by it. So it, it was like he said everything you knew and then everything the person next to you knew also. And it's just on and on like that. But a brilliant guy. Here's an example of it. So you can see this uh, rigid elements don't touch. So now I'm going to show you one series of my work so you have an understanding of what I mean when I say instrument. This is a piece that was designed to be listened to in airplanes as you fly across the country. There was a piece to be in, uh, placed in Washington, D.C. This piece was actually commissioned for a show in Washington, D.C. at the old Washington Project for the Arts, which was run by Jock Reynolds at the time. He's the guy, and that's the institution that took the Maple Flower Show after Jesse Helms shut the government funding down of, of the arts. Anyway, Jock was the director of that when, when this piece was commissioned. After I made the piece, though, I, decided to make it a transcontinental piece and make it possible for people listening, this is way before computational abilities that we have today, listen to a tape while they fly over the same landscape. So this is a piece that, after a visit to DC, and I was in a very high floor in a hotel during the site visit, watching the city through the course of a couple of days, it was like watching blood course through veins. People would come to work, they'd work for a while, and then would happen, you'd see this pulsation, they'd go home, and they'd come back in the morning, and it's just this, this kind of pulsing. So I decided to take a pulse of that. This piece is called Crank. Each one of the drums is, the corner drums is hooked to a corner of a city block, and then the two intermediate drums were hooked by wires uh, to an intermediate site on uh, the city block. The, middle part of that is like a crank, it works like a six cylinder engine. So this turns around and this goes out and flicks that. And when it flicks that, it hits this elbow, or this uh, lever right here. If this solenoid happens to be in an open state, it'll cause the drum to beat. So each one of those works like that. This crankshaft, all these pieces are turning all at once and it turns faster the more traffic there is. So at noon, the beat is very rapid and it gets very rhythmic almost percussively because of people intonating these various drums by the, where they are on the city block. At night, much more minimal and like Kodo drumming, but uh, just taking the pulse rhythmically of a city block. So then after I built that piece, I got interested in taking different kinds of sense of that because I was doing a lot of traveling around, lecturing and doing shows or installations and flying a lot, and I, 
there's, it, it was such an abstraction to be over space and not have any kind of visceral sense of the space, it's just a visual sense. So I decided to build uh, three other pieces. This is a piece that was designed, this never actually happened. I moved on before, I built all the pieces, but I never actually made the recordings in the plane because I realized, started to realize that if I could learn to do some of this other stuff, I could make this all happen in real time. And I'm at that point now. But this is a piece that measures the elevation of three elevators, in, uh, intended to measure the elevation of three elevators in downtown Chicago building. There are washboard-like dowels on the inside of that, each one of those tubes, so it goes, go, or however they are in the three, three um, <coughs> elevators. This piece was meant to go on our ranch. It's called Fence. The uh, instrument down here that, that hammers uh, the uh, wires, these are high tensile steel wires on the fence that it, that, that it was built for it. This are, these are picks that are operated by little windmills, and these are bows that, when, uh, that cause uh, bows to strum the wires, and then two resonant sound boxes. This is a mm -hmm. view, Laurel is right over there, and this is our place right here, but uh, these boxes and pieces were placed out onto the landscape. Um, and the intention being that the wind would play that portion of, of the piece. And then the final piece was in Seattle, where I-90 meets Lake Washington. So you have these eight lanes of freeway traffic going over this other kind of river thing, which is waves coming into the shore. So the piece is designed so that these sliding white tubes in these organ pipes, and you can see the flues here, go up and down relative to whatever wave is coming in. I'll show you a demo of that so you can get a better sense of it. The, a wave that's coming into the shore run by these cams up here. And then these, but these are all operated by people, which makes it impractical because people aren't good enough to run this stuff. It has to be quicker than that, and that's why computation is good. The computers people build are good enough to do this. So, so these buttons are indicators of where, and there, there were monitors placed here that had a, a video footage of actual traffic on the eight lanes of of the uh, freeways. So if a VW was going by in lane one, relative to wherever that position of that tube was in that organ pipe, you would hear that intonation of that beep as it went through. Or as if six went by in this one, you would hear that as that went by. So it translated into sound the waves coursing with the traffic. Here's a, a video of um, the wave traffic video. Brandon, if you can show that. It'll say wave traffic. Oops. to give you a sense of how that looks in action. So as these are going up and down, vehicles are passing virtually, passing under these tubes, and what you hear is the conjunction of the two patterns. And that the patterning of the wave could be adjusted. Now see, that's so simple to do with lasers on the water and lasers on the traffic. It all just does itself. And if you, if you can't get to it, you can just take a drone and hover it out there and get that information. That's the great power in computation. See, computers were designed, and I, I think I said this to the, the donors, the ones that made the sculpture outside possible. Computers were designed for war. I mean, the, that first computer was designed to do the calculations to understand the implosive potential of a, or, uh, calculations of an atomic bomb that we exploded over Japan. But I think their real value is in understanding nature because they can do things that we can't do. And again, I'll talk about those Nobel Prizes in just a minute and uh, explain that a little more thoroughly. Okay, back to the... Thanks, Frank. Uh, no, you're all right. Go, you're there. That's good. Okay. So that so that's what I um, interpret or mean as when I talk about instrumentation. It's taking something and using it to interact with nature in such a way that you get a different sense 
then you're able to any other way. And it's not necessarily a measured sense. It's a sense of feel. And so they use, uh, yeah, that's the one. Thanks, that's perfect. It's right. not full screen. Uh, just hit that go start presentation and that will do it. Thanks. <laughs> so recently what I've had to do is, and I say have to um, in a non-beleaguered sense of what I've been doing is I've had, a, had to restudy a lot of what I learned in undergraduate school, the mathematics and stuff. <laughs> but it's been easy because I wanted to do it this time and had a reason to do it. A very different way to study than the way I studied in undergraduate school where I was doing it to get a degree. Here I'm doing it to understand it. Very different kind of thing and I don't know how to explain it other than to say it that way. But I've, I've had to understand another invention that happened way, way back in the 18th century was a thing called a Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're familiar, a Fourier transform does to signals or waves that we uh, represent signals with, this in a way, the same thing that a prism will do to light. Prism will break a white light into its constituents components. So you get all these colors, the colors of the rainbow essentially, uh, with the prism, and it breaks it apart. Fourier transform, through actually simple trigonometry, they use calculus to implement it, but through simple trigonometry, we'll break a wave like this. If we imagine this, for instance, would be the representation of a sound wave, could be any sound wave. It, the Fourier transform will break it into its fundamental and then it's, uh, uh, the component, this constituent components, the harmonics of that fundamental. It'll break it down. And once you have that, kind of information, then you can use it to manipulate it, manipulate it. It's like digitizing the environment. Let me show you an example, uh, Brandon, of another. It's the Dylan uh, slides. The, what I'm going to show you here is an animation of the area between uh, Butte and Rocker, or uh, yeah, Butte and Rocker, Whitehall and Rocker, where the two highways head down this is a digital elevation model. It's nothing but elevations. It's just a grid of numbers. See the little white line? That's what the profile of that landscape looks like. Okay, so this is this here is very similar in content. It's just a series of numbers that's all a digital elevation, excuse me. It's all a digital elevation model is, is it's a series of numbers. The elevation model is just a grayscale visualization of heights. The wider, the higher. The darker, the lower. And this white kind of profile line that's going down through here is indicating those various heights. The one thing I need to show you if you're actually following this, this is Whitehall over here coming down. This is Beaverhead, where Sacagawea recognized her brother with Lewis and Clark. This is coming down I-15. But this is reversed. This is a mirror image of that that I was doing. I don't want to explain why I was doing it that way. But anyway, uh, what it's doing is creating this. So what one can do with something like that is this. I can take a Fourier transform of it. If you treat this as a uh, repeating signal so that it repeats itself like any sound wave will, then you can break it into its constituent components. I can convert those constituent components into the resonant frequencies that they are and play the sound of that profile as opposed to show you the visual of it. Now, when we have autonomous cars and they are just around the corner, we're gonna have the, the, a similar thing to the thing you have in your pocket now that you make phone calls on that's really just a computer that can make phone calls. We'll have a com computational device that you can sit within. That's what cars will be. And you won't have to do too much to get where you're going, but if you want, you can hear the environment in ways that we've not been able to do before. This is just one example of that kind of concept. So we can turn the landscape into a sonorous kind of experience as opposed to just a visual one. It also has uh, scientific applications, but I think more important and what we need to do is, is that affinity to being of a place instead of in a place. It has to be part of us. 
This planet has to be part of us to own it. We need a new definition of nature. Alexander von Humboldt said the same thing in the last part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century and made an immense voyage to South America uh, with an assistant and took all kinds of measurements and um, uh, information from the landscape to try and come up with a new way to look at nature. He came up with uh, inventions that are profound and still affect us today, the uh, isotherms, which are like a heat contour map that shows you variations in temperature and the implications of that. He came up with the notion of plants are, uh, the, the elevation that plants are growing are specific to the plant and all kinds of new information that became accessible to them because of perception expanse that uh, that scient scientific instrumentation and the uh, understanding of science had brought us to. He realized that we were functioning in an archaic sense in a modern world. And so I think we're at that stage again. We can, we can see kind of an immense ranges uh, of things. And the, um, I'll get back to the, whoops, did I kill that? There we go. I'm going to get back to these original guys and talk about that. We'll get back to Duchamp and, and uh, Charlie Russell and Einstein. The thing that has helped most with um, Duchamp is that he has the same kind of rigor that I've been talking about in Smithson and Holt and Irwin and, and these other uh, artists. He was a great experimenter and he did this rotary kinds of dangerous experiments and almost killed a friend with this glass, with these glass plates. But it was continually investigating how it is we fit into the world, what it is that makes us like we are. And also a poignantly and talented artists that could produce what we want. I show this, I am gonna get back to why this piece exists out here and I want you to notice this and the three of these, just three. I've appropriated those from this piece, which was made 100 years ago on the same month that this piece out here was installed. This piece was determined to be, by general consensus, the most important piece of 20th century art. And so to pay homage to it, I appropriated the drain holes and used them to indicate north. If you go to the north side of the piece, this will point north. And the only difference between the first three of these that you'll see out there is this one is positioned so that it aligns with the summer solstice. These, this one is so, so it will align with the uh, equinoxes and this one with the winter solstice. It's out in the street, actually. And there are little brass plates that are out in the sidewalk, but the, this, that pattern is indented into the base out there, that, as you can see. But anyway, so, and that's just an homage to Duchamp and what he did. So imagine this, this is a real thing. Imagine, this is an illustration of a, thing, a real thing. Imagine this, two masses that are 30 times, 35 times as great as the mass of our sun, and imagine them orbiting each other in an area the size of Switzerland. And the amount of energy that they're giving off is greater than all the starlight in the universe. They're orbiting each other 50 times a second. When they collapse, they send gravity waves out through the universe. Einstein, or yeah, Einstein predicted this, and there's been no proof of it until now. The Nobel Prize in physics this year was given to three people for LIGO, the Light Interferometer Gravity Observation Observatory. This one's in Hanover, Washington. There's one in Louisiana, and now there's one in Pisa. From a gravity wave that traveled through space and through our planet, uh, in 19, uh, 2015, it was detected here in Louisiana. And here's, here's the fascinating thing about it. So you deal with that massive event two billion years ago that happened. When it came through this instrument, these, these are 4,000 kilometers long. When it came through the instrument, it caused a laser beam to qu quiver half the diameter of an atom. That was how it detected. It's one of the weakest signals we've ever detected from one of the massive, most massive things we know. That's the range of our perception 
at the large end of the scale. Here's, and so it's, it's effective and validated. Now this is called Virgo. This is in Pisa, Italy. And this is brand new. And it just detected along with the other two. Um, these, these, these instruments, these massive experiments that were high risk are, are telling us things, are going to be able to tell us things about the universe that we've never been able to see before. That's the large end of our perception. The other end of our perception at the small scale in chemistry, the Nobel Prize two weeks ago went to three other people that have figured out a way to freeze cells in living organisms so that they can take fuzzy two-dimensional pictures and then make a crystal clear three-dimensional object of it, a, a three virtual object of it at the atomic level. So here it's all about scale again. We can see things that we've never been able to see before from the smallest of the small to the largest of the, of the large, and both receive Nobel Prizes. We need a new definition of nature to encompass that. So we start to understand ourselves in a different way, I think. And then the last guy. And I'll tell you why he's important to me. I'll have to read this because I haven't memorized it. A good friend of mine, Peter Koch, made a postcard of this recently. So Charlie had to give a talk to uh, the Great Falls Booster Club. And he was a person that had great reverence for the West. He had great respect for the indigenous cultures here. And he had great respect for the land they were from. And so he writes this <clears throat> before, or he says this before he starts to, to talk to this group. In my book, a pioneer is a man who turned all the grass upside down, strung barbed wire over the dirt that was left, poisoned the water, and cut down the trees, killed the Indian who owned the land, and called it progress. If I had my way, the land would be like God made it, and none of you sons of bitches would be here. <laughs> I understand the sentiment, and somehow, we have to figure out a way and rectify this so us sons of bitches can be here, or we won't be. And so the work that I'm trying to do right now is in that vein, and I'm getting old, but if I can explain in ways that are comprehensible, then I think at least what I feel about that will be understandable. I wanna show you just two last videos, um, Brandon, the one, the one that starts with Tippett. I'm building robots now, like actually uh, Von Humboldt did. I'm, I'm, I want to go explore the landscape, but I want to explore the local landscape, the space I've grown up in and spent my whole life in. But I want to use contemporary means. This is a robot. I'll let it, sh this just shows off what it can do, and I'll explain why after it, so I'll just let you watch it. This is why I like animation. It explains things quickly without. It's just showing off its ears there. And that it can fold up. This is designed to be autonomous and persistent in the environment. And this is just an idea. This will never, this is an experiment, right? showing off its motive power and how to work to travel a bit about the prairie. And to get a different view if necessary. So this kind of stuff's buildable right now. It's just a matter of concretizing design. But what it is, is it's an apparatus loaded with apparati, with written apparati, scripted instruments instead of manufactured instruments that with electronic sensors that are incredibly small now can go persistent environment and, and explore it at all scales. I have no idea what I will find or how 
the translation of that information will actualize. This is a photogrammatic, this, this is tacked onto this. This is a pho photogrammatic um, exhibition of curiosity on Mars right now. Photogrammetry is a, uh, you take two dimensional images and put those together to form three dimensional virtual objects. And that's just an example of this that I used for a, uh, a different lecture that I tacked onto this. So those two little cameras that were above this, the um, solar panel on that piece are photogrammetric uh, cameras or stereo cameras. This is just, you can see, when you see a, a photograph with square edges or like that around it, it's done photogrammetrically. Very simple process. Your cell phones have apps to do this kind of stuff. So, so we can image in ways that um, give us a new way to see new information. And that's what I'm trying to get done. And I'm right now working on basically a series of lectures that use animation to understand or to explain what I'm trying to understand. The last slide I'll show is this. This is the piece outside. Brandon wanted to know what I had in mind for the piece. That's the other reason I like this three-dimensional modeling technologies. I can send this and not have to say another word and they can say yes or no. So this was sent two years before this piece ever came into existence. The reason I accepted the opportunity was this piece was, I didn't touch it to make it. I, I drew everything, sent it to, um, out to water jet companies or whatever, welders put it together, I just put the finish on it. But what I'm interested in doing is writing code that writes code that writes structures so that robot can go out there and write code, generate code that writes structure in response to what it encounters in the landscape. So this is just, a, I'm just showing the practical application of explaining ideas. This, they had two years before the piece existed. There are differences, but it's effective enough to portray the idea. Now, that's all I have. Brandon, there are a series of slides of bicycles I encountered in my Research, if you want to just go through the slide, I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> or just enjoy the slides. Here, I'll give you this, friends. It's easier to run the slides with this. So the, the bicycle is interesting because it's beyond bike. I mean, it's such a utilitarianly perfect object. It gets used for all kinds of things. I'm really happy to see a couple, uh, three or four grad students who were here that came to the ranch last summer with Mary Ann Majorni. They're artists who are interested in land and art, which is fundamentally what drives my work. So. I'm happy to see, I, what I'm really happy to see are young people interested in the world in that context. Early bicycles were not so bicycly. <laughs> And some of them are just interesting photographs. Do you remember which bicycle it was that made the pin drop in terms of the pattern? I'm sorry? Do you remember which, which bicycle image or encounter it was that made the pin drop in terms of seeing the pattern of bicycle wheels everywhere? Uh, no, what I was doing is, I, yeah, it was the computer draw. I just thought, uh, wow, this thing's popping up. In places I didn't anticipate. Oh, then, so this was called a, you saw the two points? Yeah. It's called a penny farthing, yeah. and that's a penny farthing bicycle with the, the coins. And very dangerous. The, the, new, the bicycles we were under originally called safety cycles. <laughs> Tangy. They're everywhere. And then, of course, Duchamp, or uh, Picasso. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>
I'm happy to answer them now or later. <coughs> And no expectation if you don't, that's fine too. I have questions of you. Shall I start? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Actually, Pat, I have an observation. I think it was, it, it was interesting to listen to you and have this particular show in the gallery. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. This is, this is a because it's, artist. It's, it's not, it's coming from. I've had great conversations with her. She's an amazing artist. I'm kind of curious as to where you see these forms. My hearing span. I'll have to come with. I'm just curious as to uh, what kind of forms you see these brokers generate. You talked a lot about the code, going to the code. And I understand that, but I just have to have some visualizing what okay, it so generates. One of the things I'm interested in, I, I don't know. And that's what I'm most interested in finding out. It's very similar to those first sound instruments I built. I had no idea what that would sound like. Those, <laughs> so I showed Claude Shannon, and, and in that formula, do you know what the definition of things that have information are? This is something that's surprising. If it's not surprising, there's no information. So I'm interested in information. Stuff that surprises. But one of the things I anticipate is this. I'm very interested in the notion of fit, how things fit together. A simple example would be how a human body fits a bicycle. So you got a seat that hang large components, right? So that all alludes to our primate shape and this mechanical thing that allows us to go. So I'm looking for that, those fittings in, in nature, which we are too, how all of that happens. Uh, I'm working on a lecture that will deal with five seats right now. One that are my experience with the landscape as a human body. Saddle is one of them, a little tractor seat, uh, easy chair, uh, uh, shop stool, and a computer chair. Those are my five kind of seats of reference relative to the landscape and the way I've studied them differently. You have a specific kind of cadence on a saddle of a sentient thing, and the fit of me to that is two hyperbola together. One fits the back of the horse and one fits my crotch. And that's how we fit together. And it puts you on ascension of an animal that's perceiving the environment too, which is part of your perception that you're involved with that. Then you're on a tractor that has a whole other rhythmic thing, four, eight, six cylinders that intonates the landscape. But you go over a summer fall field all of your life, the same shape. It's like the caress of a lover's body. You learn it innately. Without knowing you're learning, you learn the shape of the land. Through that, in the easy chair, you learn about other people's investigation of that. Yes, in the shows work or any of that, you know, whoever you're reading, you, you learn the shape of that. From the stool, you learn about how you're going to make what your response to that landscape about. And from a computer, you deal with the virtual context relative to that. So that's what that lecture, performed lecture, will be about. It's, I don't know what to expect, but I know I'm going to be surprised. And that's why I want to take it that way. The further I can remove my own hand from the act of doing that, the less I influence the result. So do you have some code results already? That are, I'm sorry? Do you have some code results already that are, you know, X wind pattern, what, Y? Nothing, nothing ready for public purview. I know you're interested in that, Jesse, but it's, <laughs> no, and I'll stay in touch with you on it. Because it's critical stuff. Yeah? How do you separate the sound into the component parts? Is that With the Fourier transform? Yeah. How does it do it? How, can, how could I do it? <laughs> how could I do it? <laughs> oh, you, you can do it simply. I think it's important that you understand the process. It takes a little while to wrap your head around how the mathematics work. It can be done trigonometrically. What happens? So I didn't explain the, the Fourier transform, the way it works. but. With it, so you have a sound wave that's shaped like this, and another one like this. When you, you can add those, and it's simple, because you're in a coordinate system, so the vertical is volume, and we'll call it, say, amplitude, and the horizontal is time for the signal. So if you take, say, you go out six seconds and add that whole column, that will give you the third element. So we add the two spots on the two sine waves, and that will give us a third one. You see what I mean? So the way the Fourier transform is that if sound, sound waves that aren't in the, in the sound, 
negate each other because there's negative and positive that will happen in the uh, execution of the formula. The negative and positive cancels out, so they're not there. Only things that have a positive result are in the are in the summer. I could explain this better over if you drink beer over that. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's how it works, it's very very concrete. Thanks for coming. Good to see you guys. Um, but it's, it's just look it up. There's tons of information on the web. And expect to take a little time to understand it. And look for animations of it. That helps. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was curious to, about your comments um, that your, your Smithson encouraged you to. That's oh, Smithson encouraged you to study the tool that you were using and you know, code and that code. And so I was going to ask you about yourself as a tool, what you were, how you feel about that, and then with some of the comments here, you said you're using a computer to remove yourself from the process a little bit? Yeah, I basically, I, I'm the origin of the process, so there's no rule, but I don't want to impact that initial code. That I don't want to flavor it. I'm biased, I'm biased, I'm human. So, it's, that's the problem with scientific experiments. It, there's a real tendency doing them to want them to turn out a certain way, yet you know in your mind that failure is the most positive result, because then you know that doesn't work. It's like uh, Edison said kind of flippantly, I know a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. Right? That's true knowledge. And there's only one, yeah, at that time, one way to make them. So, I, that, and that, the whole sense of the early instruments, too, is I want to step back and observe this interaction. It's this simple. I understand the system I make. A machine like those instruments is a mechanical system, which is really just a visual formula. Every part of that is can be deduced mathematically if, if you want to, and I understand that perfectly. I want to see how something I understand perfectly understands with something I don't understand at all. And then the result yields some kind of um, intuitive notion of what, what is going on there, like the vagary and wind fluctuation. The piece outside is an instrument, but it's, it's, it's meant more as a a casual kind of celebration and allusion to cycles, all kinds of cycles. If you see the sound wave is in that, is the pedaling action generates a sound wave. You see that um, the cycles of the season as a cycle, and, and the wind as cycles, you know, speed and direction. So it's sort of an homage to, as opposed to an instrument of investigation, which is what I have time to do right now. I think I have time to do this whole phase by living my life better than I have before. Right? Do you think that the code, though, that the math is really embedded in the nature somehow? Yeah, no, no. I think math is a language that is, is strictly our fiction. This, nature has nothing to do with math. We figured out a way to use a language that depends on measurement, which is about numbers. So we figured out a way to measure nature so they can do math with it. That's why I'm math and works with nature. Galileo understood it a long time ago. He said the language of nature is, is mathematics. But there is no underlying math in nature. That's our fiction. Numbers are our fiction. What is an inch? Something we made up. But, but we can go out and find all kinds of things in nature that are an inch long. And then we can do math with that, which is a way to explore. Um, natural language is too ambiguous to um, come the kind of meaning that science needs to penetrate nature and understand things at the atomic or the billion, two billion years ago level. But numbers can do that, facilitate that kind of thing, I think. But we also need intuitive notions of it, and that's what my work's about. We fit. It's about how, how we fit. We can't be able to part from nature, I don't think, we, and survive. We have to see us in it. Anyway. Anyway. Pat, you have one more question here, this gentleman. Okay. Oh, I did want to say, um, maybe in closing, announce that we're really grateful that Pat has agreed to an extension of the installation of cycles through uh, through March, when 
it's going to align with the vernal equinox again. So that's how, I, that's, that, well, how better can you flatter an artist and say, can you have a beach on it? <laughs> 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 okay, so, no, thank you. Thank you all the time.